Stanford University. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin O'Neill in the marketing department at Stanford Blood Center. I apologize for the delay, but welcome to our Cafe Scientifique this evening. Stanford Blood Center was founded in 1978 to meet the ever-increasing needs of Stanford Medical Center. And I found out recently that Stanford Medical Center is the second largest user of blood products in the nation. So we have a daunting challenge in meeting that uh, demand. Um, our speaker this evening is a graduate of Georgetown University. He received a master's and doctorate from Northwestern in psychology and he has done postdoctoral work in the psychiatry department at Stanford School of Medicine. And he's an expert on uh, stress and treating it in the workplace. Please give a warm welcome to Jay Azaro. Well, first of all, thanks very much to Kevin and to Dana. I'm not sure where he is. Um, uh, somewhere in the house. Uh, there, and Vanessa for having me. Uh, to Dave, the tech guy and videographer from Stanford Video. Uh, it's lovely to be with you tonight. Um, we're gonna talk tonight about what stress is briefly. We're gonna talk about why it's important. We're gonna talk about the psychology of stress, the physiology of stress. We're gonna talk very briefly about non-work related sources of stress. And then we're gonna spend the bulk of the time talking about work related stress and what you can do about it both with respect to the stressors themselves, and just as importantly, how you can enhance your own resilience in dealing with any kind of stress. And then we'll have time at the end for Q&A, and as Kevin mentioned, I'll be happy to uh, be here for as long as anyone would like to chat afterwards. Uh, so I hope we'll have an enjoyable evening together. If you wouldn't mind saving questions until the end, I would appreciate it, unless it's a question like, what does that mean, or I can't hear you, or a question of that sort in which case, uh, please let me know. I just want to talk for a couple of minutes about how I got interested in this subject. Uh, I was like many of you, uh, a couple of years out of college in Washington, D.C., uh, working, enjoying a single man's life in Washington in the mid-1970s, when I woke up day, one day uh, with a viral illness that seemed like oh, the flu, except it never exactly went away. So that sent me on a search for help. And one of the things I quickly discovered during that period of time was that my outlook, my stress level, my mood, not only affected my psychological well-being, but also affected uh, physical symptoms. So outlook and mood weren't curative, uh, but if I was in a period of particular stress after the onset of that illness, I felt physically worse uh, as well as mentally, psychologically worse. And that was very interesting. So I worked with a guy who we all viewed, this was in Washington, D.C., as I mentioned. I worked with a guy who we all viewed as a California space cadet. By the way, I should say I grew up in New York and New Jersey. Um, and so uh, I consider myself open-minded, but you know, also skeptical and with a pretty good BS detector. Uh, and Greg uh, was a Californian. Um, and he had some very, to me at that time, very advanced and far out ideas about health and illness. So Greg suggested to me one day, he said, Jay, you know, you're obviously suffering quite a bit. Have you ever meditated? And I said, you know, I have some vague sense of what that is, but no, I, I never have. Uh, and he said, well, you know, give it a try. So I had taken an Asian studies class in college uh, and uh, learned that there was a small Zen center in Washington. So one night on Neophytes night, I went and had some basic instruction in Buddhist meditation. And by the end of that evening, even though I was struggling to sit still and follow my breath for 30 minutes at a time, two periods of that uh, after the instruction, uh, at the end of that night, I felt more clear headed and more at peace than I had in six months since the onset of this illness. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. That's very interesting. So that in turn uh, got me thinking about other ways that I could promote my own well-being and health myself, which for me at the time uh, was a, a great revelation. Nowadays, it's commonplace thinking, but at least in Washington, D.C. in the mid-1970s, it wasn't so common uh, to take charge of your own health and well-being. 
so that's how I got interested in this subject. So I changed my career. I came out to California. Uh, I talked myself into a job at the Department of Public Health, uh, designing health promotion programs, uh, initially in community settings. But I decided that I wanted to get involved in doing it at the workplace. So we received a federal and state grant, started doing it at workplaces in San Francisco. I brought a grant down here to uh, an organization many of you might know, Mid-Peninsula Health Service, which doesn't exist anymore, sadly, uh, but which was a terrific community-run small HMO uh, with its own physicians. Uh, and I started developing health promotion programs for employers in Silicon Valley. And I'm very pleased that uh, uh, we developed programs at AMD and Plantronics and several other prominent organizations. So that's, got me, that's what got me interested in this kind of work. Um, after a while, I decided to, uh, to do it in an enhanced way professionally. I decided to become a psychologist, uh, and my career evolved from there, and eventually wound up here at Stanford 10 years ago doing a postdoc in psychiatry. I suspect that many of you have a somewhat similar story in the sense that you have experienced something in your lives that has led you to become interested in the subject of stress. It might be difficult circumstances with a family member, a child, a parent, caregiver stress. It might be at the workplace. It might be childhood experiences that you've had that have left a residue. There are a variety of ways to have uh, a stress response triggered. Uh, but many people become interested in the subject as a result of their own experiences, and that's the best way to do it. So let's talk a little bit about people and how they might experience stress. And the first thing to say is that stress and performance are related, right? You probably know that. Uh, it takes a little bit of body-mind activation to be energized enough to do something. On the other hand, if you have a lot of stress, then productivity, good cognitive function, et cetera, go out the window. So the task is to find that sweet spot between not enough activation uh, and too much activation. And to have the ability on an acute basis to respond to a challenge, whether it's a physical challenge, a psychosocial challenge, uh, but yet uh, to be able to modulate that reaction so that it doesn't take hold of you. So I'd like to ask you, because we're talking about stress, but let, let's take a positive view for a moment. Uh, Let's talk about happiness and well-being. Can happiness be reduced to a formula? Well, the empirical research suggests that it can be. It might be something like this, uh, H equals B plus C plus V. Anyone like to take a guess as to what those letters stand for? Happiness, of course, is H. B is biology, your biological set point. We have different constitutions. They affect us in many different ways. C stands for the conditions of your life, your life experiences, environmental factors that affect you. And V stands for what you do, how you lead your life, what you do to take care of yourself. Uh, are you assertive in situations that call for an assertive response? Uh, do you modulate the stress of a long day? Do you build in some relaxation time? Do you try to get some help when you have the difficult challenge of caring for an ill parent or an ill child. So I'd like to ask you, what adjectives come to mind when you think of your work and your workplace? What comes to mind? Anyone like to share what comes to mind? Did I hear difficult? Difficult, yeah. Anyone else? Don't be shy. You're among friends. Sorry, I can't hear you. Demanding. Okay, good. Yes. Hectic, yeah, hectic. Sure. Can everyone relate to that at least some of the time? How about your life away from work? What adjectives come to mind when you're not at work? Or are you thinking about work 16-7? <laughs> <seven? laughs> 
Yeah. And you're wired in. And on top of the work-related stress that you carry away from the workplace with you, in fact, your workplace might be at home. You might never be away from your workplace. And in addition, you may have digital stress, like I had a little bit earlier this evening, uh, trying to get this presentation set up. Um, so it's important for us to recognize what comes up when in a moment of relative relaxation or quiet, we think about our work, uh, and to use that as a guide to how we might proceed to do something about those situations that are difficult for us. So I'd like to introduce you to people that we're going to be hearing from tonight. Lawrence is a tech entrepreneur, uh, a client of mine, um, uh, and he has a very interesting story. Richard is the former CEO of Sydney Opera House in Australia, uh, has been in arts management his entire career, and is a very interesting guy. Uh, and Joan, Joan Marshall, uh, is a museum director. Uh, for the bulk of her career, that, uh, who has recently started her own consulting practice. So I would ask you, are you overstressed at the moment? Are you feeling fatigued, run down? How's your sleep? Do you wake up before you have to in the morning? Do you have a hard time falling asleep? Do you wake up in the middle of the night? Do you find yourself getting frequent colds or flus? Allergies more severe? Pain, discomfort, headaches, muscle aches and pains, GI distress, common stress symptom, muscular tightness, loss of libido. Uh, as a client of mine said to me years ago, Jay, when I'm stressed, interest goes out the window. And it's very common. Perhaps you can relate to that. How about some emotional signs and symptoms of stress? Emotional distancing? Do right? you find yourself shutting down a bit? Maybe at home after a rough day? Irritability? Do you find yourself being irritable when you're not ordinarily? You know, some people are more or less irritable all the time, but. Uh, for those of you who are not, lost a sense of humor. Excessive eating, smoking, drinking, drug use, gambling, forgetfulness, one of the cognitive effects of stress when it's sustained, nervous habits. Can you relate to any of these? No? Okay. Absenteeism at work. And how about presenteeism? You show up, but you know, not much good output. So what is stress? Let's talk conceptually about it briefly. The stress process starts with a stressor, which is something that, as a client of mine said to me once a couple of years ago, Jay, something I just don't like. And I said, what do you mean you don't like? And he said, well, you know, sometimes things you don't like, but it's not a big deal. So I guess really a stressor is something I don't like that means that I have to do something that I don't want to do, or that it's hard to do, or that it's frustrating to do, uh, et cetera. Well, that's a pretty good definition. Uh, the stressor is the course, uh, the cause of stress. But of course, we have to perceive it, right? We're talking here about psychosocial stress, not, not physical stress. Uh, there is such a thing in health and medicine called biogenic stress. Uh, certain substances, substances elicit a mind and body stress response, uh, even though psychosocially nothing particularly going on for you. For example, uh, if you don't drink much coffee, if you had six cups of coffee tomorrow morning, you'd feel pretty wired uh, and it would very much simulate a stress response. But we're talking about psychosocial stress and it requires a perception, namely, is what seems to be happening to you something that you find challenging, uh, above your pay grade, figuratively speaking, hard to do, difficult, unpleasant, you shouldn't have to do it, et cetera. And what makes this particularly interesting is that, although we like to think of ourselves as rational, conscious beings most of the time, in fact, most of what 
affects us uh, happens entirely unconsciously. So for every time that you are distressed and at the moment you are consciously aware of what it is that's triggering that response, there are 10 times a day or a week or a month when things are happening that are triggering maybe not so pronounced distress response, uh, but that you're not consciously aware of it. So perception has to take place. And then there is the biological stress response. Uh, which is a mind-body response uh, that Robert Sapolsky, who has spoken here at Cafe Sci, has talked about elegantly. And I recommend his work to you. For those of you who don't know him, uh, he's a Stanford biologist. Uh, he's a MacArthur Fellow. Uh, he, he received a genius grant. And he does two kinds of research. He researches the effects of stress on the brain, uh, particularly the hippocampus. Uh, and he also does field research with baboons and he watches stress among the baboons. Fascinating research, fascinating guy. Um, but the biological stress response uh, increases heart rate, uh, pumps out various hormones, uh, most importantly for our purposes, cortisol. So let's take a closer look at that stress perception process. Do you know anyone like this guy? He's got a special hearing aid that filters out criticism and amplifies compliments. Do you know anybody like that? Right. So for stress to occur, there has to be an initiating event, that perceptual process, an appraisal process, a response, a biological response, also a psychological response, and an acute effect. And in fact, acute stressors can be good. Uh, there's a scientist here at Stanford named Ferdows DeBar. If you don't know his work, I commend it to you. He's in the Department of uh, psych uh, Psychiatry. Uh, he's at the Center for Stress and Health. And he researches short-term acute stress. And in fact, all of us who are healthy have the ability to mount a stress response quite well uh, when there is occasional punctuate stress. A brief period of stress, the body-mind system responds. Uh, but unfortunately, when stress becomes chronic, problems can result. And in fact, uh, Ferdhaus's mentor uh, at Rockefeller University, Bruce McEwen, uh, came up with this image. Uh, there's the stress response in one graphic. At the top, uh, it, various stressors, environmental stressors of various kinds, life events, trauma and abuse. Once it is perceived, it leads to a fight or flight response, which leads to various physiological effects Individual differences come into play in terms of our personalities, our coping skills, our life experiences. But the result in the short term can be a successfully mounted response to the stress challenge. But if chronic, it requires a lot of adaptation. And the nice dynamic equilibrium in the body can be challenged with the result of what's called allostatic load. I'm going to skip through that next slide. Um, and just talk briefly about the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is a very important element in the stress response. Once other parts of the mind, other parts of the brain decide that something is stressful, something is unlikable, something is demanding, something is a real challenge, signals go to the hypothalamus, which elicits a hormonal cascade, uh, which eventually results in several kinds of hormones being secreted by the adrenal glands, and most interestingly, leading to cortisol. And chronic cortisol secretion, which many people experience, is dangerous. It can lead to insulin resistance, which is a prime risk factor for obesity, diabetes, and heart disease, which of course are all related in and of themselves. Chronic cortisol secretion can lead to immune suppression, uh, infection or an infection worsening, autoimmune diseases. There is some evidence that chronic uh, cortisol secretion uh, plays a role in cancer onset, but that's why I put a question mark there. It is absolutely the case that it appears to be associated with cancer progression and recurrence. Uh, it can have cognitive effects, cognitive decline. There is a fair amount of evidence, although not yet definitive, uh, that it's associated with the onset of dementia or an earlier onset that would, than would have been the case otherwise. 
Uh, and finally, depression and anxiety uh, is associated with chronic stress responses. And part of the linkage is the biology through the cortisol response. So there is good stress, as we were saying, and Ferdhaus de Bar's research talks about that. There is a low stress resting zone when you're not particularly stressed. And there is chronic stress, which is not good. And the difference here is we're talking about acute stress, meaning seconds, minutes, a couple of hours, maybe a day. Uh, and chronic stress, meaning days and days, weeks, months, years. That's what we're talking about. And good health requires the ability to mount a good punctuate response to an acute stressor. Um, but to minimize the amount of time that one is in that red zone through staying in that low stress, relatively low stress zone. So I'd ask you on that stress and performance curve, where are you right now? Where were you earlier today? Where are you much of the time? Low stress, low performance, relaxed, chilled out, not doing much, not getting much done. High stress resulting in low performance. Are you there from time to time? Are you there a lot? Are you somewhere in the middle, the sweet spot that's right for you? Take a moment to think about that. Where were you earlier today on that stress performance graph? Where are you typically when you're working? Another way of looking at stress is to contrast the demands that we face uh, with the ability to control the situation, the decision latitude that we have. Um, so for example, if the demands on you are not particularly salient, but on the other hand, you don't have much control or decision latitude, you're in a relatively passive state. On the other hand, if the demands are high and you don't have much control or decision latitude, that's a stressful situation. On the other hand, if the demands are low and you have lots of control and decision latitude, you're pretty relaxed. That's a pretty good place to be. Or if the demands are high but you have lots of decision latitude, if you can affect how you're spending your time, what you're doing, how you're marshalling your inner and outer resources to do it, that can be an efficient place to be. You can get into a state of flow. When were you last in a state of flow at work? When you were engaged, you were active, uh, you were pretty mindful of what you were doing, it felt like flow. Today, yesterday, a week ago, a year ago, I haven't been that way in five years. Something interesting to know about oneself and one's work life. Everyone is, uh, it has a unique stress signature. That's a term that I've been using for 30 years, talking about a combination of the symptoms that you experience, both work-related and not work-related, physical and psychological, the sources of stress in your life, whether they're work-related or not work-related, whether they're ongoing conditions at work or discrete events at work, and your characteristic responses and coping style. Who are you as a person? What's your constitution? What's your personality like? How do you typically cope with stress? That combination of elements is your stress signature. So I'd like you to take a minute. You have the handout passed around. You'll see on that first page. It asks you about your, your symptoms of stress. Anyone want to uh, comment? How do you experience stress? Anybody here get headaches when they're under stress? Anybody? Anybody feel tension in the neck and shoulders when you're under stress? Anybody feel a queasy stomach when you're under stress? Anybody overeat when you're under stress? I know I don't look it, but in fact I do. Uh, anyone undereat, not feel like eating when you're under stress? Right. Um, Anyone have a hard time falling asleep when you're under stress? 
Sure. So you've got characteristic uh, signs and symptoms of how you experience stress, physical and psychological. And it's very important to know not only what the, the more elaborate ones are, but especially what your early warning symptoms are. Because then once you're aware of that, you can say to yourself, aha, I'm getting that funny little queasy sense. Something's going on. Or I'm getting that tension in my neck and shoulders. I didn't think I was under a whole lot of stress today, but my posture is pretty good. So maybe today is more stressful than I realize. So it's interesting to know and useful to know about um, the early warning symptoms. So when we work, we have certain task demands, certain physical demands, certain demands of the role we have, interpersonal demands at work, right? and all of that influences us and has certain consequences, behavioral consequences, psychological consequences, and medical consequences. But those stress responses, how we experience those demands in an uncomfortable way, are buffered by things that we can do and by features of our personality. Things like how we appraise situations, right? Maybe it's not worth sweating this particular circumstance. Um, uh, maybe I can reach out for some support to a spouse, a partner, a colleague, maybe some tangible support as well as expressive support. Um, maybe uh, I realize that it's a stressful period coming up. I'm going to be extra careful about my diet. Um, uh, I'm not going to drink for the next week because it's a particularly stressful time. Um, and I want to have my full wits about me and sleep really well in the evening, et cetera. Right? So stress response is buffered. But resilience is key. And so I would ask you, how resilient are you generally? How about your personality? Are you someone who you know, rolls with the punches mostly? Are you someone who finds yourself not rolling with the punches so well, particularly when under stress? How about your values? Uh, do you take a, a spiritual perspective on things? Do you take a compassionate perspective with other people and therefore what they do tends not to bother you as much as perhaps it used to. How about your physical health? Are you in pretty good physical health or are you suffering some physical health problem that in addition to its other features is making you somewhat less resilient to stress? How about the level of social support in your life? In your life? Do you have someone, do you have a couple of people ideally that you can really be yourself with, that you can drop the persona, that you can drop the mask? Uh, that you can really reach out to. Uh, and if you don't have people like that, perhaps you used to, can you get back in touch with them and say, I'd really like to reconnect with you? Or at the workplace, uh, to seek out someone that you have good chemistry with and try to cultivate a real friendship. Do you tend to view uh, various things that might be categorized as potential stress stimuli do you tend to view them as a threat or as a challenge? Right? You know, it's easy to say in the abstract, yeah, I view things as a challenge, not a threat. Everybody views some things as a threat. But in fact, mindset is very, very important. And the extent to which you can diminish over time your tendency to view certain kinds of characteristic situations as threats and view them as challenges uh, is a really fantastic ability to have. Uh, and again, a Stanford reference, there's a psychologist in the Department of Psychology, Carol Dweck, you may know her name, who has been researching for several years. I guess she's been at Stanford seven, eight years, uh, came from the East Coast, brought her research with her, very eminent psychologist. And she has uh, been researching the effect of cognitive mindsets on our attitudes and our behaviors. And it's really quite fascinating research. And protégés of hers have taken that, for example, into the workplace. So that when something untoward seems to happen to your team, if you and the others can view it as, yeah, it's a bummer, but it's a challenge. We can deal with this. Rather than this is a pull your hair out, hair on fire, terrible situation, uh, it not only affects your behaviors in reaction to that 
and your psychological well-being, but there's an increasing body of evidence that your chemistry, your biochemistry is affected by whether you view that stressor uh, uh, in your mindset as a challenge or a threat. Is it easy or hard? Is it pleasant or unpleasant? Um, so a famous personality psychologist, Salvador Matti, uh, developed the three C's a number of years ago, along with a protege of his, uh, Suzanne, uh, and I just blanked on her last name, forgive me, uh, Kobasa. Um, and they came up with the notion of the three C's, that a healthy outlook consists of commitment, challenge, and control much of the time. Commitment to something beyond yourself. Commitment to something that's important. Commitment to the kind of work you do. Commitment to the kinds of relationships you find yourself in. Doesn't mean that they're not stressful, uh, but commitment. Um, that you can take the view that much of what happens to you uh, that is unexpected is a challenge uh, rather than a disaster. And that you can enhance your ability and your outlook to feel yourself significantly in control of the kinds of situations that you encounter in your daily life. Now, of course, let me just go back to that one for a second. Um, and I went too far. That's easy to say, right? But think about all the people who have jobs, who have no control, no decisional attitude at all. Right? Think about the bulk of blue collar jobs. Think about many white collar jobs. Chances are uh, we in this audience have a significant amount of decisional attitude in how we spend our days. Is that a fair statement with a Stanford sort of audience? Um, a, a few head shakes. Um, but there are many people in our society uh, perhaps most people in our society who have very limited decision latitude as to how they spend their days at work, what they do. The work comes at them and they got to get her done. Right? So that's very challenging. So Matty and Kobasa defined hardiness as a blend of resilient attitudes, coping skills, support enhancing interactions, and specific behaviors. Hardiness. How hardy are you? That's a good question to ask yourself. Hi, I'm Lawrence Patrick. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Roscoe Labs, a startup company here in the Bay Area. I'm also a consultant. I wear a lot of hats for my job. Um, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm living a very fast paced life, I'm trying to get a startup company off the ground. Um, in addition to that, I have to um, pay bills as we bootstrap and um, try to raise money for the company and to do that I've been doing a lot of consulting um, and I've also done a lot of work helping other companies as an advisor and board member um, for other startup companies. Um, so I get pulled in a lot of different directions for work. Um, in addition to what I do in my work life I'm also a dad. I have two children. My son is eight and my daughter is 10. I'm divorced um, and I recently got engaged to get married again. Um, my bride is Australian and so having a long distance relationship is, as you can imagine, very stressful. And I'm very excited about that, but at the same time, it does uh, create a lot of stress, as you can imagine, trying to balance uh, the, the um, the demands of a long distance relationship with uh, all of the requirements that go into getting married. So um, it's, it's a lot. I'm doing a lot. I have, a, as I like to say, I have a lot of moving parts. So I'm, I'm definitely a work in progress when it comes to managing stress. Um, but uh, I've come a long way. Um, one of the physical manifestations of stress that I experienced in college and high school was um, a lot of um, physical issues related to, to GI issues um, that I had because I was super stressed out. I didn't, I didn't make the connection then, but as I learned more about stress response and as I learned more about my body, I realized that it was directly connected 
to um, my overall stress level. And I've been able to completely eliminate those GI issues through managing my stress better. So I'm still not perfect, but um, I've definitely come a long way. Um, and I'm still learning a lot about it. I think it's probably, um, I think managing stress is probably the number one challenge and the most important um, thing any good CEO can do. And the ability to manage stress, the ability to um, uh, also understand the difference between good stress and bad stress and being able to reduce good, good stress and being able to use, I mean, reduce bad stress and use good stress as a launch pad um, to keep you motivated and energized and inspired to do your work. I think it's probably one of the most important things that that any CEO can master. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, like I said, I'm still working on it, but uh, I've come a long way. Interesting guy, very talented guy. Can you relate to his situation? Uh, two families. Two careers, essentially trying to get a startup off the ground, uh, and also working as a consultant. Uh, busy, busy young guy. Uh, very challenging. Um, so I asked you earlier, you know, uh, what what causes you stress at work and away from work? Think about that for a second. See if you can relate to any of these. Working adults frequently say. See if you agree. They're fatigued, not enough sleep, busy lives. Children, family situations, spouses, partners, work-life balance challenges, not enough time, not enough fun. My family gets me at my worst. Not enough time with my kids, spouse, partner. I never see my friends. Too many household moves and my support network is flimsy. I don't have quiet time, no time to charge my batteries. Conflict between professional role and personal life. Uh, this was a participant in a Stanford executive program for nonprofit executives a few years ago. She said, in my small community, I run the large arts organization. I can't go to the hairdresser looking like a slob, so even when I'm off, I can't really be off. Uh, and everyone got a kick out of that comment. How about financial pressure? The biggest work-related stressor, if we can frame it that way, uh, is unemployment. If you've ever been unemployed and wondering, uh, unemployed not by choice, uh, and you've been wondering where the next meal is coming from, the next rent payment, the next mortgage payment, what have you is coming from, you know that that's massive, massive stress. So financial pressure or a boomer phenomenon, which is lots of boomers are not nearly as well prepared for retirement as their parents, very, very stressful. Health concerns, a disability, very, very stressful. How about an ill child or an ill spouse or parent? Anyone here in the sandwich generation? Taking care of kids, taking care of parents as well? Very challenging, very stressful. And again, to mention a Stanford resource, uh, you may know the name of a psychologist in the Department of Psychiatry based at the VA, Dolores Gallagher Thompson, who has done landmark research on identifying caregiver stress as a very real phenomenon uh, and developing training programs for individual caregivers to help them cope with the stress. Fantastic work, well validated, really helps people, uh, major, major contribution, making a difference. Um, being in the sandwich generation is very, very difficult. How about the burden of your own idealism? Right. You started out, you wanted to make a difference, things happened, you feel like you're not making a difference. Right. Or you are making a difference, uh, and you feel compelled to make a difference, but it's stressful as heck. Right. Very, very stressful. So you might do what she's done. She says, I'll be home late. I've joined a support group for women who need a reason to stay at work until the house is picked up and dinner is on the table. That's a good support group, all right? So when you think about organizations and organizational stress, uh, it's useful to, to start off by framing it with respect to what are good organizations? What do they do well? Uh, 
and therefore what might they not be doing that generates stress for their people. Well, good organizations uh, have a culture uh, that is supportive of their people. Uh, good organizations have leadership that is attuned to their people. Um, good organizations have appropriate decision-making patterns and structures that make it relatively less stressful in teams and organization-wide to make good decisions. Uh, they hire good people. They develop good people. They take care of their people. Um, uh, they set up work processes and systems, whatever the nature of the organization is, uh, that not only get the work done, that get the widgets out the door, or the proposals out the door, or the contracts out the door, or whatever their product is, uh, but that uh, are cognizant of the impact on their people, and they try to ameliorate and attenuate the stressful impact on their people. Um, so those are good organizations. But of course, lots of organizations aren't so good. Right? Um, so for example, organizational sources of stress can include the physical environment, um, uh, which is everything from uh, temperature conditions, the pleasantness of the environment. How about cubicle culture? Anyone here like cubicle culture, really, who works in a cubicle? Anybody? Yeah, no. Um, were there a lot of cubicles around 30 years ago? No, not so many. Are there a lot of cubicles around now? Yeah, there are. Um, do they have some benefits? Yeah. Um, but they have lots of negatives, and one of them is you're being interrupted constantly. Um, people are stopping by to talk about, sadly, Stanford's loss tonight, uh, tomorrow morning. Um, those kinds of things. So cubicle culture, uh, like many things in life, has benefits, but it has a big downside. So the physical environment can be stressful. So think for a minute about your physical environment at work. Just give it, give it some thought. Is it pretty good? Is it stressful for you? How is it? How about your functional environment? That's a fancy way of saying the content of what you do. And here I'm particularly thinking of things like too much work to do and not enough time. Can anyone relate to that one? Anybody? Yeah. Um, or work that is sometimes too demanding in terms of its uh, uh, requirements for knowledge and skills on your part. Can anyone relate to that one? Like me trying to fine tune this presentation tonight when I arrived, you know, I thought I had some technical gifts, but obviously insufficient. Thanks to Dave uh, and Brian at the other end of my phone uh, for helping me get off the ground. Um, how about emotional work? Have you ever heard that term, emotional labor? Uh, that was a term coined, I believe, 30 years ago uh, by a sociologist at Cal. Cal does do some good things sometimes. I know we at Stanford don't like to think so, but. <laughs> That's right, go Bears. Good for you, go Bears. Uh, um, and uh, I will think of her name in a moment, but did pioneering work identifying that many jobs have a strong emotional component, meaning that you have to be on, not just cognitively on, but emotionally on. Like, for example, working in a call center. You not only have to be knowledgeable about whatever uh, organization and service or product you're representing, you've got to take care of frustrated people. How about other kinds of positions that have a strong emotional component? How about if you're a nurse or a home health aide? How does that look? Right? So emotional labor, emotional work is very, very important. How about the, uh, the volume and the pace of the work? How about your roles at work? Do you wear multiple hats? Do, those, do all of those roles suit your personality? Do some of those roles require you to be more extroverted than you are by nature? Do some of those roles require you to be less extroverted than you are by nature, for example? How about the, the contextual environment, meaning the organizational culture? All right. Is it a good culture? Does it take care of its people? How about the quality of leadership higher up? And how about the quality of your immediate supervision? We talked about that earlier a little bit. How about interpersonal relationships? at your workplace? Is the teamwork pretty good most of the time? 
Not so much. Is there hostility at work? Is there reasonable diversity at work? Is there discrimination at work? Uh, even now, well into the 21st century, lots of individuals uh, encounter uh, gender, ethnic, other forms, sexual orientation forms of discrimination or bias, even if it's subtle. It's astounding that it still exists, but it still exists. What's your workplace like in that respect? All of these things are sources of stress. So when you ask, for example, nonprofit executives, and I know that there are several in the room, uh, what some of their key job stresses are, financial pressure, constant fundraising, and those of you in the private sector can relate to that. If you're in a startup situation, you're fundraising as well. Um, your company, your organization may always be uh, one step ahead of the wolf financially. Uh, needy clients, the burden of the mission organizationally, Stakeholder stress, lots of people who are interested in what you do, internal to and external to the organization. How about teamwork and staff conflicts not being optimal? Board staff conflicts, those kinds of challenges. How about employees? Lots of turnover in certain kinds of organizations. Variable motivation on the part of employees. If you're in a supervisory position, that could be a big challenge. Time pressure is obviously an important challenge. Inadequate skills. You may have come up, and this can apply to people in the for-profit sector or the governmental sector as well as the nonprofit sector. You may have come up as a specialist in something, but then you got into management, and you're not particularly skilled in many of the features of your position. That's very stressful. Does your organization help you uh, develop and grow in that respect? Do you have access to training? Uh, do you have access to coaching, for example? On the other hand, um, while there are stress management retreats, sometimes the biggest benefit is to the person who doesn't go on the retreat. This guy says, my staff just left for a 10-day stress management retreat. I'm feeling more relaxed already. <laughs> right. And some more stressors. A poor professional support network, can you really talk with other people who are similarly situated? Lack of control. Middle management is very, very difficult, right? When you think about it, you're not usually making policies. You're administering policies as a middle manager. You're getting all the pushback from the people who are on your staff. You don't have a whole lot of leverage vis-a-vis -vis upper management, typically. Um, you don't have a whole lot of control. How about the political and social environment of your organization and public attitudes that affect you? Bias we talked about. The burden of leadership. You have to be on all the time. It can be very, very challenging. How would you like to be this guy? His boy says, we want to include you in this decision without letting you affect it. We want to include you without letting you affect the decision. That's a nice situation. So broadly speaking, there are three approaches to managing stress. You can eliminate or mitigate the stressor. Right. If you have a long commute, you can arrange, for example, to work from home a day or two a week. Carpool, uh, come in real early in the morning or after the morning rush. Right. That's an example of eliminating or mitigating the stressor, and there are lots of examples of that. You can change your response to the stressor. You can say, for example, well, commuting's a drag. I can't stay home very much. I have to come in at eight o'clock in the morning, so I hit the traffic, but I'm gonna have some books in the car, I'm gonna expect that there is traffic, I'm gonna get a reasonably early start, and I'm gonna to say to myself, I'm just not gonna sweat it, right? So you can develop a new perspective, a new mindset. You can acquire tools, right? You can take a course in, for example, mindfulness-based stress management which is a very popular program, started 30 years ago by someone named John Kabat-Zinn at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, which introduces mindfulness skills in the service of individuals with medical illnesses, uh, but also people with just day-to-day -day problems managing their stress better. You can develop new tools. And of course, you can enhance your resilience. So you can eliminate or mitigate the stressor, develop a, a new mindset, develop a new perspective, change your response in some fashion, or you can enhance your overall resilience. 
So I'd like you to think for a moment. What can you do in the stressors that confront you right now at work or at home to change the stressor? Is there something you can do? If the team dynamics are lousy, can you go to work on them in conjunction with your supervisor? Can you ask your supervisor to bring a consultant in uh, to do some training and consultation on the team's dynamics? Is there a stressor uh, on your list where you can change your response? You can develop a new mindset about it. You can frame it as a challenge, and maybe not so big a challenge, instead of a stressor. And when that stress response starts to crop up in the moment, you say to yourself, ah, you know, this is relatively small stuff. Uh, Rich Carlson says, don't sweat the small stuff. He also says, it's all small stuff. And of course, it's not all small stuff, uh, but much of what we get concerned about is. And finally, what can you do to enhance your resilience? You can be more assertive. How about this guy? He says, no, Thursday's out. How about never? Is never good for you? That's a famous New Yorker cartoon. Uh, and the, uh, the cartoonist, who's also the uh, director of their cartoon program, was interviewed on the Fresh Air program on public radio a couple of days ago, and it reminded me of this cartoon. It's a great, great cartoon. Hi, my name's Richard Evans, and I'm a senior arts executive here in Australia, coming to you today from Taupo in New Zealand. I've worked for the last more than 20 years in largely the performing arts sector, managing small, medium and large organisations, ranging from a two-person puppet theatre company in Auckland, right through to a Shakespeare company out of Sydney, uh, managing the Australian Ballet Company out of Melbourne, and more recently uh, as Chief Executive of Sydney Opera House and also managing a, a large-scale uh, tourist attraction in Sydney, uh, the Bridge Climb experience. On top of that, all of us, as well as our work, have our home life. I've, uh, I am now into my second major relationship. I have a 16-year-old daughter, and I also have a two-and-a-half-year-old son, and another one, a boy or girl, yet to be determined, arriving this June. So those home life pressures have changed throughout the years, but certainly the rigours of a 24-7 chief executive role combined with a lot of domestic and international travel and conference commitments uh, put a lot of pressure on the home life, which in turn puts a lot of pressure, a lot of stress on the individual. And learning how to manage that is something that, that has been um, of great value to me over the years. In these positions there's always a million reasons not to exercise and we all know how great it is when we are exercising regularly so we can't underestimate how important that is and Jay will speak to you today and he'll bang on about kind of supplements he'll talk to you about meditation and all this other stuff and I've got to say when I started to work with Jay over eight years ago now, I thought, he's just some West Coast hippie. Uh, he is, but everything he says works, which I find intensely aggravating. So just to come back to, you know, the biggest stressor in my life has been this issue of stakeholder management managing the relation, your, your professional relationships, but also your home relationships and your broader family relationships. And in order to do this properly, you've really got to be at the top of your game physically. You've got to be fit. You've got to be really, really ordered in your workplace and have procedures in place to make sure that you can manage all of these relationships as well as possible and for you to be as present as possible when you are within each of these stakeholder environments. And I think it's this presence or this ability to be really on with whatever you're doing, whether you're talking to your child or doing a large commercial deal, it's this ability to be present and in the moment, which can, you can only really do consistently if you are physically and emotionally well rested and really fit, as it were, in every sense of the word. So. My big take out is 
really spend some time on yourself. Make sure you are emotionally and physically ready for the challenge ahead. As a New Yorker, I had a good laugh when he viewed me as a West Coast hippie. But I guess it's all relative. All right, so just briefly, um, we're going to talk just in a very cursory manner about how to enhance resilience. Sleep, very important. Napping, absolutely a terrific thing. How many of you, when you can, take a power nap? I'm just interested in a show of hands. Yeah. Well, there's been a lot of research in the last 10 years on the uh, cognitive benefits of napping. Short naps, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, even if you don't fall deeply asleep, very, very refreshing, very, very powerful. Uh, workplaces should have, and they did for a while, and then they uh, started to disappear again. There should be nap rooms. Uh, and of course, in cubicle culture, it's hard to take a nap on the floor, uh, but you, know, you might be able to. Uh, earplugs and eye shades, just like you might take them on, a, on an airplane flight, right? have earplugs and eye shades in the office. Uh, and sleep in the evening. How many of you consistently during the work week get eight hours of sleep? How many of you consistently get about seven hours of sleep during the work week? How many of you consistently get about six hours of sleep a night during the work week? How many of you consistently get less than six hours of night sleep a night during the work week? All right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if I had a blackboard, I would draw a normal distribution. So naturally, everybody who thinks who's getting six, five, six and a half hours of sleep is thinking, hey, that's great. I'm in the 95th percentile. But the research has shown, started by Bill DeMent, William DeMent, uh, the terrific uh, sleep psychiatrist here at Stanford who's retired now, has shown that for 98 percent of the people, six hours of sleep a night doesn't cut it. You're building a sleep debt, and it's having performance uh, and well-being impacts for almost everybody. Again, there are exceptions to the rule, uh, but I would encourage you to try to build a way, find a way to get more sleep. Uh, it will enhance your well-being and reduce stress. Deep relaxation and meditation. How many of you have a mindfulness practice, a deep relaxation practice of some kind? Just a show of hands. Just a couple. Oh, gosh, people. Really? Give it a try. Um, and I know, you know, meditation is boring. You sit there, and nothing happens. And a thought pops into mind. And then another thought pops into mind. Well, actually, the whole point is just to sit there. And when you think of it, to bring your attention back but if the mind wanders, the mind wanders. And the mere practice of sitting there, for example, for 20 minutes, more or less every day, has now been definitively shown to reduce stress levels and enhance cognitive function. So if there was something else you could do for 20 minutes a day that would enhance your cognitive function and reduce your stress levels, would you do it? For example, if it was a pill that cost very little, right? but you had to take it for a total of 20 minutes a day, right? Would you do it? I bet you would, right? Try it. You might like it. There are lots of resources for you. How about movement? How many of you get reasonably regular exercise? You know, three, four, or five times a week. Do you find it stress relieving? Good. It is, absolutely. It enhances cognitive function. It relieves stress. Uh, it's good for you in many, many respects. How about your diet? How many of you eat pretty much whatever you decide to eat in that moment? Oh, come on, I know, I know there are more like that. Because even I, you know, the West Coast hippie, I do that myself uh, from time, particularly if I'm under stress. Um, diet is a huge subject. Uh, let me just say that there are certain foods that are energy enhancing and other foods that aren't. For example, protein that contains healthy fats is energy enhancing. If you've got to perform in the afternoon, don't have pasta 
uh, for lunch, have protein and some vegetables for lunch. That's energy enhancing. If you have to give a talk in the evening, uh, uh, you know, at 6 o'clock, have some protein and some vegetables. Don't have pasta. It'll bog you down. Um, have breakfast, as Lawrence Patrick was discussing in his clip. Very important to have breakfast every day. Um, but to eat things consistent with your energy needs, and, and as best you can, to minimize your consumption of pure junk. And I commend to you Michael Pollan's principles on what is good food and what isn't. Good for you. Do you have any experience with energy medicine? Anyone here who you know, takes herbal supplements, Chinese herbs, Western herbs, anyone who's ever experienced acupuncture and has felt tuned up afterwards, right? A general energy improvement. Reiki therapy. Anybody here ever had a good professional massage? How did you feel after a good professional massage? You felt relaxed and invigorated, chances are. Right? In the immediate aftermath, you might have felt kind of spaced out, you know, but 5, 10, 15 minutes later, you felt pretty good. Very important as part of resilience to take care of yourself. How about building in some quiet time? Do you build in some quiet time? No electronic screens, no electronic stimulation. Uh, do you take a Sabbath of some kind? Or do you check your email 16 7 uh, 365? Right? Do you put the iPhone by the side of the bed and it buzzes through the night and you check it? Um, understandable why you might want to do that. Not so healthy. And it's a very good idea to take a news fast. I'm as much of a news junkie as anyone, but I learned a number of years ago uh, with great difficulty to periodically take a news fast. And my wife can attest to the fact that it's with great difficulty. But nevertheless, the news will be there the second day. How about fun and hobbies? Do you do stuff that you enjoy? Or are you just working and taking care of family? How about hobbies? How about support from family, friends, colleagues, mentors, a coach? a therapist. Might that be helpful for you? How about a vacation? What a concept. Uh, I tried to get a clip of it, but I wasn't able to get one. Have you seen the recent uh, uh, commercial uh, with the, and I just blanked out, it's a Ford commercial um, with the new electric car, and he says, he, he talks about the French, uh, the uh, 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 Irish-American actor. Uh, Dana, can you think of his name or the, uh, the name of the commercial? Oh, Cadillac commercial, that's right, yeah, yeah. Have you seen that one? So he says, those French, what do they do? You know, we Americans. And he even says, we take two weeks. Most people I know don't even take two weeks vacation, right? What a concept to take vacation. How about taking a long weekend regularly? How about catching up with the, the people you live with? How about love? What's the love situation in your life? Receiving and giving. How about helping others? Many, many benefits to the individual, whatever the benefits are to the recipient, altruism, compassion, generativity, caring for others within moderate limits is very beneficial to the individual. It's been well established now in scientific research. How about deep meaning systems? Are you religious? Are you spiritual with a small s? Do you find some transcendent meaning in life? Do you pause to notice the beauty in life? Do you take time out to notice that life is happening right now, even as we speak here in this room? Life is happening. Uh, and lastly on this point, how well do you really know yourself? Have you availed yourself of the opportunity to really get to know yourself? Have you ever seen a therapist? Would you like to? Are there family issues, marital issues? Would you like to consult a professional for some help? These kinds of issues can be tremendously stressful, um, and consulting a professional can be enormously, enormously helpful. And lastly, how about professional development in your work role? Can you get better at what you do? Do you avail yourself of those opportunities? Are you assertive enough uh, to ask for them? Uh, would you like to have a coach? Your organization may provide one for you. 
So we've talked about sleep and fitness. I also um, try to focus on my body and taking care of my, um, my body, my energy level. I try to eat for energy um, and have gotten really disciplined around having breakfast every day. I'm the kind of person who tries to avoid breakfast usually. But um, one of the things I've learned is uh, how important it is to not only have breakfast, but make sure you eat in the kinds of foods that are gonna give you energy throughout the day so that you um, are able to, to function and um, able to reduce stress. So I paid attention to some things that affect cortisol levels and things like that, that, um, that can really make a big difference in how you feel by the time you get to two or 3 p.m. in the day. Thank you, Lawrence. On the other hand, you know, as Carol Dweck's research and the research of others uh, establishes, uh, what we do is very important tangibly, but the mindset, the attitude, the motivation that we bring to it is important. Um, for example, what do you think of these folks? I started my vegetarianism for health reasons, then it became a moral choice, and now it's just to annoy people. <laughs> to do it for health reasons, good. Uh, to do it for uh, ethical reasons, good. To annoy people, to prove how exceptional you are, maybe not so good. Hi, I'm Joan Marshall. I'm a nonprofit consultant. I launched my own consulting practice recently after spending a number of years as a museum director and professional fundraiser. So for me, the biggest issue and challenge in my professional career has been in how to manage, uh, how to manage stress. And um, I think I do that through some of the obvious ways, trying to get enough sleep. I, I watch my diet carefully. Uh, I'm always working on my tennis game. Uh, but more importantly, you know, my time is my biggest asset. And I try to stay organized. I think that's important. I try to have a plan that is both a short-term plan and a long-term plan. And I think when I have a, a written plan, it's easier for me to, to take the stress off my everyday uh, decision-making because I know where I'm going. Uh, I do like to get up every morning and, and spend five or ten minutes meditating, just clearing my mind and getting uh, sort of balanced and, and getting a perspective. Uh, when I meditate, I feel like my own problems seem small in relation to, to the universe. Uh, but I think it's, it's really important to have both professional goals and personal goals. In fact, I have my own mission statement. And I, I don't want to be one of those people who wakes up 10 years from now and says, oh my gosh, what, what happened to those 10 years? I was here and I thought I'd be there. Uh, I think regret is a terrible thing. And I want to feel that I'm in control of my destiny, uh, both my personal destiny and my professional. Um, I think it's important to show up every day, to live in the moment, and to be mindful of your life. And to remember that this moment, this moment right now, is the most important moment of your life. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Uh, last thing I want to talk about just briefly is what leaders can do. We have some supervisors in the room. We have some leaders in the room as I look around. Um, the first observation uh, to make is that leaders inevitably generate stress for the people who are under them or report to them. But they should also be stress reducers. Right? Would you agree with that? Are most leaders stress reducers as well as stress generators? Some are. Uh, it reminds me of a classic New Yorker cartoon, and I tried for weeks to find it in and around other activities. Wasn't able to find it. But if you can picture this, picture an old time cartoon, and it's an executive in the 50s coming out of an office building in Manhattan, and there's an old time paper boy with a cap on, like a Kangol cap, uh, and he's holding a newspaper, and the headline is, Stress is Epidemic. And the executive brushes past him and says, I don't get stress, I give stress.
But you know, it's important to remember that as a leader in a supervisory position, you're an authority figure. And your staff is always going to view, view you, at least in part, through their own issues. The fancy term in my trade is transference. Uh, but you, know, you don't need a, a psychology degree to understand that, right? Uh, that the, the leader can be mommy and daddy, in part. Have you ever encountered this? I would have gotten that report to you sooner, but I wasn't held enough as a child. <laughs> or, and particularly in this valley, because we have a lot of exceptionally talented people in our neck of the woods, right? Um, it kind of reminds me of what Garrison Killer talks about in Prairie Home Companion in Lake Wobegon, where you know, all the children are above average. Well, around these parts, you know, everybody, just about everybody seems to be above average. Uh, but they're, you know, special is good, but entitled is not so good, right? You might agree with that. So what do you think about her? She's saying to her kid, why are you special? Because I'm your mommy and I'm special. Thank you. Thank you. Could you say a little bit more about Hi. Cortisol levels, I mean, it's not something that a doctor usually checks, or what kind of symptoms would a person have if those were running high? Yeah, uh, it, it's a really good question. Uh, the biology of this is not my area of greatest expertise. Um, but cortisol is a secretion from the adrenal glands. Uh, it's a very powerful hormone, has lots of effects. One of the effects that people have been hearing about in recent years uh, is it tends to put, or to lead to the deposition or the deposit of abdominal fat, um, which I noticed because the last couple of years have been particularly stressful for me. And even with the same caloric consumption, uh, for the first time in my life, I put on a bit of a tummy. Um, uh, it can be checked. Uh, one of the interesting ways to look at it, and there's been a lot of research at Stanford on this subject, uh, is looking at the daily pattern throughout the day of cortisol. Uh, for example, uh, 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 Pat Fobert just stepped out, but she was here in a second. She's worked on research. I saw Cheryl Koopman in the doorway, a uh, colleague, former colleague of mine in psychiatry. Uh, and the basic idea is that there is a characteristic pattern of cortisol levels during the day. Um, so in the wee hours of the morning, cortisol tends to rise to enable us to be activated for the day, going back to the good stress aspect. Uh, and then early afternoon, mid-afternoon, it starts to taper uh, so that by 9 o'clock at night, it's tapered quite a bit, and 1 o'clock in the morning, it's way down for the healthy, normal person. But on the other hand, different groups of people show abnormal cortisol patterns. For example, it is a, di a disordered pattern with depression. It's a different disordered pattern uh, with some of the chronic viral illnesses and so on. Um, so cortisol used as a diurnal pattern, that's the fancy term, uh, is very, very interesting. Um, uh, and beyond that, I, I'd be happy to, to make a couple of suggestions as to how you might look into that further uh, afterwards. Thank you. Hi. Well, Hi, first of all, you? thank you for the, for the speech. I think it was, it was great. Thank you. It'll, I have a question because when you started, you, you, you spoke about uh, happiness, and I thought you were going to, to make some kind of relationship between happiness and stress. Can you elaborate now about that? About yeah, very that? good question. Um, uh, so, you know, let me ask you folks, can you be happy and stressed, or are they mutually exclusive? Can you be happy and stressed? Yeah, yeah, I think so, absolutely. Um, uh, happiness can be defined as the accumulation of momentary states of affective up, right? Which is a little bit different from a, uh, a deeper uh, sort of psychological well-being, which can have to do with your sense of mission in life and your relationships and so on. But it's entirely possible to be happy in the moment or for a day or for a week and also be stressed. But chronically, if individuals are moderately highly stressed or highly stressed over a sustained period, they tend not to be happy. And that makes sense, I think, intuitively as well. 
Hi, Dana. Uh, microphone, please, just for the recording. Uh, you were mentioning, you were saying that uh, lack of control can be stressful, but, and you mentioned like the blue collar job, how that could be stressful if you're not in control of your work. But uh, I mean, I, I know plenty of people with blue collar jobs, they love it because they, they don't have to think too much and they can walk right. away from their jobs and leave it at work while having too much control. Right. You take the work home with you and it becomes right. more stressful. Right. So, I mean, that's And that's absolutely thing. true as well. Um, uh, and mindset is everything. Um, for example, I, I suspect when, when you were a young man, uh, you had blue collar jobs in high school and college and the like. Yeah, I did too. Uh, I stacked cases in a Pepsi-Cola bottling plant uh, one summer, uh, road construction, you know, jobs like that. But my outlook was different because, you know, I was a high school or college kid. I didn't view it as a career. On the other hand, if, say, due to a bad economy, if you and I uh, took on jobs working construction right now as schleppers on a construction site, you know, for 10 bucks an hour, yeah, I bet we'd find it stressful. So it's that variance between how things are uh, in your perception and how you'd like them to be or expected them to be that can lead to that, that dissonance and that stress. How do wise leaders reduce stress? How do I? How do wise leaders oh, reduce? Oh, yeah. Well, good question. I'm, I'm glad you asked. We'll just zip through that. Uh, very briefly. Oh, all right. Well, uh, we'll just talk about it. Sorry. I didn't realize it wasn't on. Well, first of all, you know, to be fair and respectful and ethical, um, uh, to know their people. You know the old expression, it's been around, I don't know, 30 years, uh, managing by walking around? Very important thing to do. Um, uh, ask questions. Really listen. Listen more than assert. Um, empathize. Genuine empathy. Um, and then give feedback and advice. Right? And that's true for all of us. Uh, advice can be good. What people mostly want is to be understood and heard. Right? Um, uh, I grew up in a, uh, an Italian, Irish, Jewish family in New York. Um, <clears throat> right, so, so that's a pretty good combination. Um, and I learned, excuse me for the hoarse voice, maybe I'm getting choked up thinking about this, but um, I learned early on uh, from how I was treated, it, it was a very good situation, terrific parents but very animated people. Uh, and so I learned, uh, you know, from day one, that affection and love uh, were typically expressed by telling people what to do, <laughs> right? And giving unsolicited advice. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, I fell in love with a woman who grew up in a different sort of uh, situation, right? So, you know, a challenge to work out. Uh, but for leaders, lots of listening, not so much talking. Thank you. But just to answer the question, uh, and again, the physiology of this is not my area of greatest expertise, um, but there has just been an incredible, well, as you know, an incredible amount of research in neuroscience, um, neuropsychology, uh, and other fields that relate to this. Um, so there is now a significant body of research, for example, of meditations. Um, uh, Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, for example, uh, just using meditation as an example, one of the effects of meditation is that it actually modulates uh, the, the uh, stress response in the brain. So uh, even though there, there might be a surge of cortisol, when that gets backed off, um, then a process is taking place where hippocampal function is improved the amygdala's function is improved, 
various circuits between those bodies and the prefrontal cortex, uh, which is the executive control portion of the brain generally, uh, is improved. And in fact, uh, regular meditators increase the thickness, apparently, of their, of their cortexes. Yeah, uh, so just on meditation. Um, uh, aerobic exercise, for example, when sustained several days a week, uh, has some similar effects. Uh, different dietary components have very powerful effects. For example, healthy proteins and healthy fats are brain enhancing, whereas cheap carbs, sugars, and so on uh, actually contribute to hypercortisolemia uh, directly and indirectly and have a negative effect on cognitive function. So there's been lots of interesting research, and I would commend to you uh, for a very readable uh, look at some of this research, uh, a colleague and friend of mine, uh, Dr. Rick Hansen, who's in Marin, has written several books. Uh, his most recent book is Hardwiring Happiness, where he integrates the neuroscience uh, and the psychology uh, in the service of cultivating happiness. Um, Yeah, yeah, uh, another good question. So, you know, I, I, as you probably know, uh, stress theory dates back uh, to Hans Selye and earlier, um, but the psychology has become much more refined in recent years. Um, the neuroscience has become vastly more refined in recent years. For example, the notion that there is good stress is a relatively recent notion, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, one of the leading lights in that area of research is right here at Stanford, Ferd House to Bar. Um, uh, so th those punctuate periods where the body mobilizes, the mind and body mobilizes a strong stress response are actually good. So for example, if you experienced a, what would be an example, a needle stick, one, you were otherwise healthy, and you had a, an intentional needle stick once a day and that was the only stressor you had, that would be generally great. The problem is that most of us are encountering many stressors, so the, the punctuate pattern can tend to become a wave that sustains. You're welcome. Hi. I think you had a question first. Hello. If, if these stresses are a mini fight or flight responses, how come we can deal with these as well as our ancestors did? How, can, how come we cannot? Thank you. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, the short answer is that the kinds of stressors that they encountered were typically those time-limited short-term stressors. Uh, the fancy term is punctuate, as in their bodily responses were punctuated from time to time, maybe several times a day, by that stress response to fight or flee. Whereas in modern urban life, we tend to be confronted by lots of stressors uh, that can become chronic. And so we're experiencing a stress response, for example, at a moderate level almost all the time, and then at a high level for a significant portion of the time. Or we're doing okay at, say, a low moderate level generally with work, and then a family tragedy hits, a cancer diagnosis in a loved one. And then you go into overdrive, the caregiver stress kicks in, and what was a very manageable, low to moderate, typical level of stress becomes a moderate to high or very high level. So it's the chronicity that's the problem. Sure. Yeah, you, you joke briefly about a pill, and it sounds like there's a big market do you know whether pharma has looked into the notion of something that would enhance cortisol metabolism so that when you found yourself, you know, just 
chewed up by stress. In goes the pill and, and the cortisol is, is lowered in the body and, and the body is relieved from the stress, from the, from the cortisol. From your lips to God's ears, as long as it would be uh, health and, uh, uh, healthy and safe to do it. Well, you know, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that uh, there's advertising on late night TV, right? Uh, last time I looked, is it still around? Any night owls in the group? Uh, late night advertising, talking about suppress that cortisol response, take the belly fat off, and so on. I think that's tricky. I, I'm going to speak personally now uh, to mess with that response, except under medical supervision uh, in that sort of way. But on the other hand, there are cognitive enhancers. Uh, for example, uh, mild doses of caffeine can enhance memory and cognitive performance for short periods of time in an otherwise healthy person. Uh, there are various herbal compounds that are cognitive enhancers with no downside uh, in a healthy person. So there are pills that are cognitive enhancers, um, uh, but the question is, can you find out enough about how to use them safely and well? And in fact, as, as a, a well-known physician once said in a speech I heard many, many years ago, uh, if caffeine had not been around for hundreds and thousands of years, uh, the FDA would be very challenged to think about approving it. It would go through a very careful uh, trial period. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.